So shrubbery notation. So shrubbery rotation was a, it started out as, well, it started out as a different thing, but the main idea in, in contrast to what Jay said and Jay foreshadowed this sum is the idea was a reader that only partially groups. So if you're gonna write something like X plus Y times Z minus 10, the job of grouping that and deciding on precedence wouldn't be the job of the reader as we understand it in this expression world, but instead would be deferred to a parser. Um, but that doesn't mean that all uh, decisions would be deferred to the parser. So the reader is still going to do useful things. It's still going to have a notion of grouping, if nothing else, parentheses, right? Um, but as we'll see, uh, more, more grouping than that. Um, that is a, a kind of um, upper bound or a lower bound on the grouping, right? It says that in this, in this example, for example, um, the parsing of times is not gonna jump out of the parentheses and affect um, how, how G is treated, or G is not gonna, if we're, you know, we probably mean these to be lines, so it's not gonna go back and change how F uh, is, is treated in the parsing, right? And as Jay said, this is connected to some ideas we had tried out and that John Rafkin worked out. Uh, in detail for his dissertation. And uh, those, those ideas eventually carried uh, directly over. Although the parsing part there, the inforestation part actually leads into what we build on top of shrubbery notation. Um, but uh, you know, the notation was set up for that. Um, so uh, Jay also mentioned this intermediate point called sapling notation, um, which was line sensitive. Uh, it was after seeing Lexpers and I, tried taking seriously this idea that, that line breaks and uh, could matter and uh, you know got into using colon and so on. So the idea is that when you write line breaks, that's really a strong indicator of your intended grouping. Maybe there's more grouping within the lines, um, but at least uh, the lines as they're separated mean something about the grouping that you want. And also, as Jay said, the, what this does is it lets you avoid a lot of closing parens, closing brackets and so on, all those closing delimiters uh, you get to leave off in a, in a visual, visually appealing way. And although I was happy with that, I decided, well, I'd better just try out Y space sensitive, you know, tab, you know, indentation sensitive syntax to make sure I don't like it. Uh, it turns out that I did like it better. Uh, and it's because, well, of course, indentation is a strong indicator of your intended grouping, um, but then you can avoid even more closers. So here you can see that this G is less indented. It's not meant to be the body of the G anymore, but it's still inside fun F. So it's meant to be part of the enclosing function. Okay. So yes, it looks nice. Uh, could we make it work out? That's where this all went. Um, so the rest of this is meant to be a kind of tutorial or quick tour, but do interrupt me when you have questions again, either the, the chat in, um, in Gather uh, or the document there, or Jay will uh, interrupt me if you if you post something on YouTube. So let's talk about how these things parse, uh, kind of in the same way that Jay described Lexers. Um, there's gonna be fewer categories here. The main category is just a group. So to a first approximation, everything on a line is a group. So that's one group with one, a plus, a two, a times, and a three in it. And if you put things on different lines, then those are different groups. So one through three, that's one group. And then five through six, that is another group. You can, if you want to separate two things uh, in a line with a semicolon. So that creates two different groups here. Uh, semicolon is not an operator here. It's part of the reader syntax, kind of at the same level that parentheses would be. So it's not that it's bound somehow to separate, it's that those things at the reader level are two different groups. Um, a semicolon will never create an empty group, so you can throw an extra one at the end if you really want to. You can put as many in the middle uh, if you want to. In shrubbery, we ended up not doing this kind of thing very often where there's some options about how you write things, and, but uh, in the case of semicolons, it seems to be helpful and work out okay to just allow redundant semicolons. By redundant, you mean they do not show up in the parse. That's what you meant. They don't show up in the parse and um, they, they don't form empty groups that would show up in the parse also, right? So these three semicolons, there's could be some groups between them, but there are no empty groups. And so uh, they just go away. Um, so then we get to the indentation part and that's where colon comes in. Colon starts an indented block. Um, and then the block has a sequence of groups. So here, log status, 
and then adding in parentheses, that's one group, and x plus one is another group. And the blue box around those, that's meant to be the block holding them. Now the, the semicolon, the, the colon is kind of part of the block, although it also doesn't show up in the parse. But that block now is part of the group where the semicolon is. So the, the group is the function symbol, the f symbol, x in parentheses, and a block. And then that block has two things inside of it. Uh, the indentation for a block um, is two by convention, but you can put as much indentation as you want, and it doesn't matter. You can also start the block uh, content on the same line if you want. And now here, it's whatever token is after the, the colon, whether it's on the same line or not, uh, that determines the indentation for all the groups within that block. Um, so that's why X really does have to be lined up under the L here. So that's uh, one way of creating a block. Another way, and this is taken directly from Lexpers, is the idea that bar is another special thing um, because bar looks really nice for things that branch like if or cond or matches uh, as an SML. Um, so when you have a, a bar, that means this line that starts with the bar that is more indented with respect to the previous line. We experimented with having colon bar combinations, but um, you know, based on some community feedback and experiments, this is where we've landed. So bar means the, the current line is more indented than the one before it, and it's creating a block that continues that uh, previous lines group. But then um, a new bar starts uh, another alternative here, and to the right of each bar is another group. So it both uh, creates a group in the enclosing thing, the first bar does, and then each bar creates groups on the inside. So we've got a group with error small here, um, sorry, a block with one group error small in it, and another block here with two groups, one that starts val and one that starts delta. Now I've left some space here in front of the bars, but uh, we've decided that the standard indentation is to just put the bar directly under, um, but we also count bar as indented automatically by half a, half a column. Right, so you, that kind of corresponds to this, the fact that there's white space to the left of a bar. And this avoids some ambiguity. You can't line up a bar and a non-bar on the same column. Um, so there, that uh, makes sure that uh, the space of things you write is smaller. The area, uh, since, since we're starting a block after the bar, you could put it on the next line if you want to, just like you can with, some, with a block started with a colon. Uh, you can also, just like colon, its content can start on the same line. A bar can be on the same line as the group it's extending, and its block can be on the same line. And uh, in this case, a, a bar ends that first one and, and starts a new alternative. Um, the rules there are a little bit subtle, but in practice, they work out pretty, pretty uh, intuitively. You can also have a mixture. So I've started the first bar, uh, put the first bar continuing on the original line, and then uh, the next line, uh, the next alternative with its bar on the next line, but the first bar there uh, determines the indentation wherever it is. Okay, and then the last, uh, the last place where you can use indentation is that if you start a line with an operator, then it can continue the previous line. This is a relatively late addition in the design based on experiments and feedback, um, and it seems to work well in combination with other refinements we make. So this is one big group that has four pluses and, and five identifiers in it. Uh, here's another even better motivating example where um, bar by itself is an alternative, but bar greater than is just another operator. And so this is uh, chaining things together like you might do with pipelines or, or generators. Um, I think I'm forgetting the right word for these things, but- uh, Threading methods. Threading, thank you, threading, uh, which you, where you might thread three things. Okay, so those are the, the indentation rules. Um, when you have parentheses and square brackets and securely braces, there are no new indentation rules. It it's just works the same um, on the inside. So I can have a function here with its body uh, nested under there with conditionals, uh, all as the argument to list. I guess there is a little bit of a new indentation rule, which is when you open a parentheses, you're gonna have a closing parentheses. So the relative indentation of the content of the parentheses relative to the outside of the parentheses doesn't really matter. Uh, so you can start it wherever you want to. And the, uh, the environment would indent like this. Uh, you could even indent it less than the list dot here, although that would look terrible and you should not do that. Uh, but the key point is that indentation doesn't somehow turn off just because you go inside a parentheses. 
The flip side of that is if you have an expression that's using indentation, you can just uh, wrap parentheses around it if you need to. Um, but one difference, there is another uh, difference about parentheses, uh, which is that you have to separate groups, not just by line breaks, but with, uh, but with a comma, and it doesn't have to be a line break. So comma is something like semicolon, except inside of parentheses, square brackets, and braces, um, except it's required. So here, because I've got a comma between X and minus Y, that's two different groups. Um, even if I put them on the same line, the comma is separating the groups. Um, if I left out the comma, then of course, that means one group, X minus Y. If I left out the comma and put it on two different lines, then that's just a, an error, a reader error. Um, so the intent here is that People mean to put commas to separate things inside of parentheses and square brackets and so on. And so uh, let's make it required and, uh, and take advantage of, of that being required. Uh, unlike semicolon, you cannot have redundant uh, commas. Like you can't create an empty group uh, using a comma. That would be a reader error. You are allowed to have a trailing comma though. This is a concession to uh, when you have long lists of things and want to put it on multiple lines uh, and many languages allow this. Can I ask a question about the comma? Yeah. Um, for the function example with filter, if I uh -huh. want to have a second argument after that, yeah. where does the comma go? Does it go it next could. to that five? Yep, it goes right here. So you put a comma there, there and then it'll be lined up under the fun, the next argument. Yeah, that, that's kind of neat that it can be at that last spot. It doesn't have to like be unindented from the fun. Yeah, let's, let's go try this out. So I'm going to switch into Dr. Racket now. Um, if you want to play around, play with this later, uh, there's a package. It's not registered on the package server, but you can install it uh, as a package from there. Um, and that will give you hashling shrubbery uh, in Dr. Racket. So just to, to try out this example a little more, fun x, let's see. So we're doing map and fun x, x plus one uh, onto a list one, two, three, something like this. I wouldn't actually write map like that, of course, I would write it like this, but uh, that's an example of the kind of things. So the environment is, is helping me out here with tabbing and it's, you can't see me at the tab key, but that means it's a, it's a realistic uh, indentation. And then when I run with Ling Shrubbery, you see the parsed form of that. So I'm gonna go back and, and talk about that. Um, yeah, let's, let's start with something simple. Again, let's go back to one. So if I have the Shrubbery one, so what we're seeing down here at the bottom is the read result of one as an S expression. So one by itself is right here, but then it's on its own line. So it's in a group. And then I'm just using top to group everything at the top. So if I have one and two, that's two different groups. So there's a group one and group two. Whereas if I put one and two on the same line, then that's group one, group two together. If I have an operator like plus, then that shows up in the parse as, uh, as an up uh, node here. Whereas if I have just a variable like X, just an identifier, it's not wrapped in any way. So um, in principle, identifiers and, and operators could, could overlap, um, but uh, as we'll talk about in the lexing part, they, they don't, but there's a connection here to uh, how do you deal with the uh, racket style identifiers in, in the shrubbery role. Uh, let's try a block here. So if I say begin one, two, and run it, then you see that reads as uh, a group that starts begin. This whole thing is gonna be one group. We see one S expression here. Uh, it's got a begin token, but then we've got this colon with two more groups. So that is parses as block. And then we have the two groups. And I liked how Jay showed the grammar in his uh, talk before. So it turns out the grammar of what uh, shrubberies read at is looks like this top with some groups, groups with elements, an elements either an atom or an operator, or things with parentheses, braces, brackets, or it's a block, or it's an alts. I've showed you some of those. Let's uh, let's do a few more. So if I do one in parentheses, that's a group that has parentheses that has one group in it with one in it is two groups in the parentheses. Change it to square brackets, then it's brackets instead of parens. I change it to curly braces, 
its curly braces. Right? So we are distinguishing those different shapes of things. Um, I see someone wonders about a parse error, so let's leave off curly brace there. Um, so expected close curly brace. Let's say x colon. This turns out to be an error because empty blocks are not allowed, um, except with some other syntax I'll talk about later. Um, let's try alternatives. So what if we say if x, then y, else z. Actually, you'll notice that uh, this is a valid indentation, and that was the first one that showed up just because I didn't have a bar there. But uh, that's the other indentation here. And if we parse that, now we see if and x, and then a sequence of alternatives is, is in an alts where each alternative has its own block. Uh, whereas if I leave the y out here, then of course uh, I can get the empty block error message. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to show here. Um, that gives you some sense of how things parse out um, and just a little bit of the uh, environment support. So to fill in many of the, uh, the pesky details, identifiers are uh, just letters and numbers and underscore. Probably emoji should be in there, but we'll, we'll figure that out later. Um, when I say alphanumeric, that those are Unicode properties, right? Um, and the usual rule that you don't start with a number. So these are all identifiers. Um, operators, uh, unlike Jay, I was happy to just allow uh, crazy UFOs like this as operators, um, but there are, also, are some interactions with things. So of course you can't use all the characters that we've reserved like parentheses and comma and semicolon. And I'll mention some of the others later. Uh, there are also some details with avoiding ambiguity with number syntax. So plus and minus and also commas, these are a little bit restricted. Um, and then we're also using colon and, and vertical bar. But most other things, Unicode symbols and punctuation uh, are allowed as operators. Numbers compared to racket, the number syntax is greatly simplified. You have exact integers, perhaps in hexadecimal form, but no octal, no binary, um, floating point numbers in the usual way, or the three special floating point numbers, not a number infinity or negative infinity. So we're using the, the scheme hash here as our escapes to do these one-off uh, constants. If you need to get fancier identifiers or fancier numbers, like maybe XT steel is your favorite uh, racket number, which is an exact hexadecimal number that's a complex number using polar notation, uh, you can do that by using hash uh, curly brace. So hash curly brace gets you into the S expression world with all of the racket S expression complexity and, and syntax. Um, you can even misspell non-negative if you want to. Um, so that's the uh, that's one of the key things. Is that um, actually a racket escape or does it escape to lexemes like integers and identifiers? It's, it's an S expression escape. So there is a constraint on the S expression that it can't be list shaped. Um, otherwise that creates ambiguity with the representation of, of um, you know, parsed but uh, parse rubberies, but otherwise it's it's all of racket S expressions, which you shouldn't use probably. I don't know, but that's, we have that escape for now. Booleans, hash true, hash false, probably uh, nothing surprising there. Same for strings, except we fix up the minor detail of, of disallowing literal new lines like racket uh, allows. Keywords, um, for keywords, we use tilde. So we wanted something lighter weight than hash colon. Uh, this was a discussion among a number of people uh, uh, about what we should do here. And we settled on this and it's, it's worked out pretty well. So we do have keywords that are separate from identifiers uh, or operators um, because they have all sorts of uh, benefits for, for building syntactic constructs. And then at notation is just built right in, uh, very much like it is in, uh, add expressions when you mix it with S expressions. There are a few differences that make it uh, work better, um, but uh, you can probably read this and guess what it means. The only thing that's really different here is that you can have multiple curly brace things in sequence uh, because of the way this desugars into, uh, into the underlying shrubbery. Um, it makes sense and, and is useful to, to have that. 
comments are basically C style. So line comments or uh, slash star ending with slash star, but they can nest on like in C. And then there's also uh, the analog to S expression comments. So uh, what we're commenting out with hash slash slash is a group. Um, so here, this is commenting out, remember the group starts fun FX, and then it's a block that's part of that group. So that whole group gets commented out. You can also use this uh, group commenting form to comment out just one alternative um, in, in a sequence of alternatives, which is not exactly the same thing as commenting out a group, uh, but, but very similar and, and works out similarly in the syntax. And you see here, we are commenting out the group that supplied the keyword argument base two. Um, this comma is separating groups, so we don't need to comment out the comma exactly. We're just commenting out the whole group there, and so it, it works in the in the natural way. It is possible to be explicit about your grouping if you want, and um, I'm using uh, geomots for that um, because um, because it's not really meant for you to type directly. But there are a lot of situations where you just want to turn off uh, white space sensitivity. I know some of you are thinking like all the time, but um, for those times that you really need to, uh, for moving code around or something, um, the rule is you can use these opening brackets just after a colon or a bar, and then you close them off explicitly, and then you separate groups explicitly within them uh, using a semicolon. So that thing parses the same as if you erased all of the, uh, the noisy characters. This one does too, even though it's all smashed against the, uh, the end. Um, you could even put it all on one line. Um, but that's sort of the natural form. And, and if it looks like this in the environment, you re-indent it, it'll of course go to this kind of shape. Um, and uh, the Dr. Racket implementation, you know, the plugin right now has a key binding for armoring. So, you can, let's suppose we had if, well, let's suppose we had this thing, but we're going to move it down here into some other place, um, right? And if I just copy it and paste it, then of course the indentation is gonna get messed up. Um, maybe a way to deal with this is, first I have to make it valid, um, is armor it, right? And I didn't talk about colon, uh, Guillaume, but that just groups the, the whole set of things together in case there's multiple ones. Then I can put it over here. Then I can make sure that my indentation is fixed up within, and then I can unarmor it. And um, this is part of the experiment. So that's the one big drawback I know about the indentation sensitivity. And this is one way we're looking at, at how to deal with it. Uh, also, just when you print uh, shrubbery, uh, the printer puts these things in so that it. Uh, it can just be on one line or not, depending. Right. So uh, if you want to get into more of the details that I haven't talked about, you can go to uh, Racket Rhombus Brainstorming. Uh, I think, uh, let's see. No. If you do that, you get to this GitHub site, and the README has uh, pointers to these actor proposals, as well as state of Rhombus and general discussion. Yeah, We jumped right into the Rhombus. Uh, syntax experiments here, Jay and I did. We didn't give you any sort of overview. Uh, if you wanted an overview, uh, that's a place where you can go. I will also mention that this examples link here um, are the examples that uh, Sam mentioned earlier too. All right, so that is my whirlwind tour of shrubbery notation. Are there any other questions? Right, there are two questions that are kind of like, questions that fit at the end. Okay. So one is, um, so someone had a question about, does shrubbery support something like the and that was in my talk where it like takes the next thing and like makes it so you don't need to indent it? Uh, no, no, I, uh, I can say that I experimented a lot with and to go along with vertical bar and the end decided not to, to pursue it, so. Um, there is backslash, which has the usual backslash meaning. It just continues the line. If I try this, um, well, let's see, we got a different error message there. But. So you can see how this doesn't want to indent anymore because it's continuing that line and then it's going to complain about this not being lined up there. Uh, but no, there's nothing like the end. Okay. Um, another question 
is that um, so Lisp has really like uh, created a uh, like its own continent of its own uh, syntactic world where it's very if I'm making a new language, um, I can very cheaply implement S expressions and you can just start using Emacs and you'll be able to edit my weird language. And um, if I make a new language that, and it's very cheap, by the way, for me to make my language has, have S expressions. Uh -huh. And um, if I make my language have something that's kind of like C, uh, I'm not gonna get a lot of support for free in other uh, environments. Um, it's gonna be maybe a little bit easier to like get them to treat me like C because I can like copy and paste some other thing and like add my keywords. But adding uh, C, implementing C syntax is kind of hard. Um, do you see it as a goal or something that could be done in the future? Or what, what do you think about the problem of shrubbery being beyond racket? Like, can we create a new category of syntax where people say, oh, I use shrubbery syntax in my language that, you know, I've implemented in JavaScript or Haskell or, you know, there's just some other language that's not part of us that is using this new kind of idea because this is a very new kind of syntax. It's not exactly like, oh, it's just Python, but it's different. What, what do you think about this problem? Well, that certainly is the intent. Um, and that's why this presentation and the, the rhombus brainstorming and proposals was separated out the reader level notation um, from imposing an actual language or even a macro expander on top of it. So that's the intent to do the S expression version of something where function calls look like function calls and, and arithmetic looks like arithmetic. Um, how general that turns out to be, I, I don't know. Time will tell perhaps, um, but that certainly is the intent. Okay. Uh, and, and, and part of it, just to, to make a little connection to S expressions, when you do S expressions in Emacs, the indentation that you get from them may or may not be what you had in mind, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the one of the goals here is to remove that question, like to have enough riches, richness in the syntax where the indentation is purely driven by the reader level, um, so so that you don't need binding information or you don't need to customize that to your particular flavor of shrubberies as opposed to S expressions. Maybe here's another way to ask this question: If if you gave me a C, if you gave me C code and you said uh, implement a C parser. And it doesn't have to be like real actual C. Okay, yeah, I didn't answer the other half, right? Which is how easy is it to, to implement this parser? Yeah, it's nothing like S expressions. It's way, way trickier to, to build the parser. So it's more like C in that sense. Like if it somehow succeeded, then what would happen would be there would just be the Emacs shrubbery parser that you could use as a component in your other thing. But it's no, it's nowhere near as easy as just conzing up a new S expression parser real fast for your, your new embedded language. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so another question is um, that dot notation. Uh, is, did, you, you never said, here's the time when we do something special with dot. Right. Is there no such thing? Like, is it not There's, special? And why, how is it not special? It's not special at the shrubbery level, which just another operator like plus and minus. Um, but we'll talk a lot about dot in when we, uh, when we apply this uh, notation to a language. Um, someone asks, uh, why, why the name shrubbery? <laughs> uh, well, it started as sapling was an idea. You don't have the full tree yet. You just have some of the structure and it's going to grow into a full tree with parsing. Uh, and then, well, shrubbery is the Python, the Python style. Uh, Python style is sapling. So that's how it became shrubbery. Yeah, yeah very good. <laughs> cool. OK, so um, this is good. So we'll reconvene at 4.30 in about an hour. And uh, we'll do another walkthrough of the actual like language macro expander part of the current Rhombus experiment with, uh, with Matthew again. And uh, I hope that there will be lots and lots of details and questions for this because this is like, gonna be quite a bit meatier, I think, with your degree. Yeah, and, and people might want to take a little bit of time in the, in the break to go look at um, the, that Git repo. I mean, so I'm presenting a bunch of stuff here and I did some implementation work, but I really got a lot of feedback and direction and redesign for, from, the, from other people uh, involved in those discussions. And, and you can go see how some of this evolved if you want to. Cool. All right, great.
Okay, so uh, the live stream will turn off now and we'll uh, connect back up in about an hour. Thanks, everyone.